We continue in our worship this morning of our risen Lord by turning to the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to look specifically at verses 13 through 17 this morning as we continue in this uh, uh, very impactful study in the Gospel of Mark. As you're turning there, let me just remind you the last time we were with Jesus, he was in a crowded house in Capernaum. We saw that there were people in the crowd who wanted to hear from him and wanted to be healed by him and experience his miracles. And we considered last time that God alone can forgive sins. So it was shocking to the Pharisees when Jesus told the paralytic man, Son, your sins are forgiven. They said, Who alone can forgive sins but God? And of course, this is exactly the theme of the Gospel of Mark. It is the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God alone can forgive sins. Jesus was indeed God in human flesh. And that's his point. To prove his authority as being sent by God the Father, not only does Jesus heal individuals spiritually, but he heals them physically as validation or proof that he was, a, he was indeed the Son of God. He told the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And, and many were afraid and even amazed. And many did not believe in him, especially the scribes and the Pharisees. And as we studied this last week, it was a, it was a reminder to me that there are many people who follow the crowds. And many people who even follow Jesus because of what he can provide for them by way of miracle or by way of uh, temporal blessings. But true disciples follow him because only Jesus can forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We saw the crowds were following Jesus. In fact, later in his ministry, as the crowds began to fall away because his teaching became harder and harder for them to fathom, he looked at the disciples and said, Do you want to go also? And Peter said these striking words, where else will we go? Who else has the words of life but you? And those are, those are profound statements because really the reality of this, this gospel, the gospel that we love, we celebrate, and we live and move and have our being in, is really the gospel of God that forgives our sins and is coming to call sinners home. It's also a reminder last week that we need to preach the word in season and out of season because it was clear that Jesus was in Capernaum. He was preaching the word to them. That is the reason for which he came. Preaching the word to the crowd at Capernaum. It was his preaching that converted people, not his miracles. I, maybe you'd like to take this issue, up this issue with me, but I don't see anywhere in the scripture where a person was converted from sin just because they witnessed something miraculous. In fact, you can read Luke 16 of uh, the rich man who suffered in hell and wanted to warn his brothers not to come to this awful place. And, and Abraham said, listen, he has Moses and the prophets. In other words, he has the word of God. If he doesn't believe the word of God, he would not believe even if someone comes back from the dead. So we want to be reminded that we are not here to put on a show or to amaze people or to even have people be astonished with, with anything that we do. It is simply through the word of God that God in his providence brings faith in our hearts. It is a miraculous work, indeed, the most miraculous work, over and above any kind of physical healing that we could ever experience. And as a church that loves the truth and seeks to be faithful to the gospel, we must not forget the clear command of Jesus to fulfill the Great Commission. He makes it clear as he goes about preaching the gospel and, and calling sinners to repentance. And later he would tell his disciples and tell all of us that when the Holy Spirit comes, we would be his witnesses. We would be the mouthpiece for preaching the gospel, calling sinners to repentance, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that Jesus commanded. As we grow in our love and faithfulness for one another, we can't forget that there are lost people outside these four walls that desperately need to hear this message and experience the grace that we too have experienced. I know that seems very obvious, but as you come to this text time and time again, it's amazing how simple and clear the message is. Jesus comes to call sinners home. 
And as people come into our church or wherever we encounter them in the world, we need to be pointing them to the grace of God in Christ Jesus, the grace that was shown to us. So here in our passage, Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, we're going to see once again, never gets tiring, we're going to see once again the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in saving sinners like us. Jesus, let me just give you a little bit of a summary of where we're going. Jesus did not come to save those who already think that they're righteous, think they're good. He came to save those who know that they are not righteous. Let's read Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I would pray that as I begin to attempt to convey your truth, that Lord, it would be your voice that uh, these dear folks hear. I pray, Lord, that your truth through your word, by your spirit, would be conveyed in a way that is clear and convicting and confirming and that through this study of your word, honor and dignity and glory would be brought to the name of Jesus Christ. And again, as our brother prayed earlier, I would pray, Father, that if there is someone here who is outside of a saving relationship with Christ, that they would today be reconciled by grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like us to look at this passage. Again, these are narratives. They, they move in a, in, a, in, a, in a pretty understandable storyline. They don't jump around so much. You can imagine a, a scene in a, in a crowded room. You can imagine a scene by the Sea of Galilee with crowds coming around Jesus. It's not too hard to kind of, in our mind, take, take uh, ourselves there to where Jesus would be teaching by the sea. He left the crowded house in Capernaum, went out by the Sea of Galilee. The people were coming. Coming to him, and again he was teaching. And being out in the open is not to escape the crowds, but really, I believe, to add to bring more access to Jesus so they could hear the gospel. So, first, as we as we consider this scene we have before us, let's consider the conversion of a tax collector. The conversion of a tax collector. Verse 14: as he passed by, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now, the tax collector's name is Levi. He's better, he's better known by his Greek name, Matthew. In fact, this is the Matthew that wrote Matthew's gospel, and he refers to himself in that gospel as Matthew. So I'm going to refer to him as Matthew. But his name is not nearly as important as his occupation. Here we have this designation of a tax collector, or elsewhere you might hear the word publican. And, and they were those Jews who had bought a tax franchise from the Romans. And, and the Roman government would sell these franchises to Jews. They could collect any amount that they wanted from other Jews. They could pay the Romans what the Romans required and then keep the rest to themselves. So they were very lucrative, but yet really filthy kind of... Uh, uh, corrupt businesses, if you will, franchises. These tax collectors became very wealthy at the expense of their own people. And they were not particularly like income tax collectors, but you can imagine it'd be like toll booth workers, right? I just went to New York on vacation, and I always grumble and complain that at some point, weren't these, weren't these highways supposed to be paid for? Why am I paying these tolls to drive on the road when I pay taxes? That's a, that's a whole other story. But, but, but Matthew would be kind of like this, this individual who would be uh, taking taxes for people who would be coming in and out of the region and doing commerce. So he might tax some of the goods that they were bringing in and out as they moved commerce to and, and through, the, through the area. 
So that's kind of the idea we have, because here he is, he's sitting in a tax booth. And you can imagine tax collectors would be seen as despised, and they were despicable, and they were, they were traitors to the Jewish people. This is the way they were thought of. They were thought of as traitors. They surrounded themselves with other tax collectors and, and thugs and enforcers that would do their bidding. And you get the idea, right? They were the outcasts of society. And just to bring the point home a little stronger, they would have been ostracized from their families. They would have been disqualified from ever serving on a jury or being a judge because they were, they were just known to be so corrupt. And they would also be barred from going to the synagogue ever, ever. These, these are Jewish individuals who should have been afforded all the opportunities to worship in the synagogue. They, they would have been despised by society. I think you get the picture. And with all that in mind, isn't it surprising that Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Jews, comes through and he calls one of these individuals to salvation, this despised tax collector. If you're just thinking in your mind, what is, what is the occupation that you have the least respect for and the greatest disdain for? This is kind of where tax collectors were, were seen by others in their area. You can imagine the surprise when Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. Now, the words that we read here in verse 14 shouldn't be unfamiliar to us. They were used when, when Jesus called Andrew and Simon and, and James and John to come and follow him, and they got up and left their businesses and followed Jesus. It is indeed a call to salvation. It is a, is it a call to, to follow Christ and trust in him all of their lives. No reputable rabbi would even speak to a tax collector. And Jesus had been, his fame had been growing, his legend had been growing, and now he's calling this wicked man to get in line with the other disciples. Try to imagine a surprise. It is possible that James, John, Simon, and Andrew have actually had to pay taxes to Levi through their fishing business. So I'm not trying to step outside the bounds of Scripture, but, you know, James, John, Andrew, Simon, hey, this is looking like a pretty good group, but, but not that guy. Now, I don't, not that, that, that tax collector. I mean, that was like a pejorative, you know, like next time you're at work, you want to insult somebody, like, you tax collector. I mean, that's what it would be like. That's what it was like in their society. To call somebody a tax collector was to really use a pejorative. Furthermore, Matthew knew he was hated by his countrymen, so it wasn't only that people hated him, he was well aware of his situation and his lot in life. He knew he was hated by his countrymen. He was under no illusion or pretense of being accepted or even liked by anyone, let alone this little band of disciples who followed Jesus. But I have to stop and pause here. And I have to remark, but isn't this another reminder of the kind of people that Jesus calls to himself? Okay? I could say, look around at the people next to you, but really you need to look at yourself. Jesus calls the, the most unlikely people to follow him. It's yet another example. As Paul would say, not many noble, not many wise. You know, God would call the foolish to shame the wise. This is really an example of God's grace shown through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives grace to those who deserve it the least. But that's exactly how grace works, isn't it? Grace is freely given to undeserving sinners by God who is rich in mercy and grace. Now, this is a caveat, this side note, it's not, it's not in here. This is my personal if you do not see yourselves as the most unlikely person to be saved or the most unworthy person to be saved, then there's still some heart work that needs to be done. Because by the time we get to the end of this passage, Jesus makes it clear that the kind of people he comes to save are those who don't deserve it and those who know they don't deserve it. And so we're not portraying some, some low self-esteem when we say that, that really I am the worst sinner in the room. I really mean it. I hope you all mean it. The idea is that not that we're owning a franchise, maybe we're not running around and doing illicit things that we read about in Scripture, but I know the propensity and the tendencies in my own heart and my own mind. Don't you? 
This is what makes grace so amazing is that God shows us grace when we don't deserve it. The whole area was a buzz about Jesus, so it's likely that Matthew knew about him. Perhaps he'd been convicted of his lifestyle. It doesn't say. Perhaps he was convicted of his sin and wanted forgiveness, and if he ever had the chance when, when Jesus would walk by that he would try to engage him. We don't know that, but what we do know is this, that Jesus knew Matthew before the foundation of the world, and at a point in time he called him effectually to follow him. We know this, that Matthew's heart was regenerated, that he experienced new life, that he was born again, merely from the fact that he got up and followed Jesus. Matthew's heart was, was full. He repented of his sin. He trusted in Christ. I know that's not what the words say, but that is exactly what we have here. We have the call to salvation because Matthew was following Christ. And I want to say this, that following Christ is trusting Christ. Trusting Christ is following Christ. You can't say you're trusting Christ if you're not following Christ. Now, it's clear that this tax collector became a new creation in Christ that day. And even Luke 5.28 says, And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. So Luke adds even more. He left everything behind. Wouldn't you say there would be a radical change in this guy's nature to leave behind his business, to leave behind his tax booth, to, to leave behind his friends? To leave behind his reputation, his money, his livelihood. No way he could go back to his family. They would disown him. He can't go to the synagogue. He's not allowed to go there. He couldn't get another job with tax collector on his resume. He has no choice but to follow Jesus because Jesus is all he has. Jesus is his whole life. He has no other choice. He simply follows Jesus. And isn't that pretty much what it means to be a Christian? I mean... It means you have to give up your life and your desires and your agendas in order to be in alignment with God's. It means really the end of my dreams and my desires and now starting to live for the Lord, which is far better. When God calls a man or a child or a woman, they never stay where they are. I often thought about the fishermen who left their nets and followed Jesus. I often think about those who immediately walked out, those who immediately were healed, all those pictures of salvation. When God calls somebody, there is, there is a response. There is something that takes place. They're, they're not where they used to be. It's a perfect picture of salvation. Jesus will take me just as I am without one plea, but he will not leave me there. Right? He will not leave me there. He will not leave us where we were when he calls us. He will call us to follow him. And the true regenerated heart will follow. He calls me, he calls you to deny yourself, to take up your cross daily and follow him. And so the point I'm making is that when Matthew was called to salvation, he responded and went. Now, I think you would agree with me that if you've been a Christian for any length of time, that it is alarming when people claim to be Christians but yet give no evidence of their salvation. They claim that they had a, a saving encounter with Jesus Christ, but then you look at their lives and they're exactly in the same spot they were in. I'm not talking about the same job. I'm, not talking, I'm talking about the same spot spiritually. You have to wonder... Were they really called? Did they really respond? Are they really trusting and following? And as I think about that question, why is that such the case that there's so many who claim to be Christians and give no evidence of it? I think it's fair to blame the kind of preaching that we hear today. The kind of preaching that doesn't explain the true nature of saving faith or doesn't really explain the demand for repentance or the cost of discipleship or the necessity for obedience and following the Lord Jesus Christ. That's archaic. That's legalism. That's what? No, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. 
I mean, it's been so watered down and so, and so manufactured and, and so slick in its presentation now that a lot of times the gospel is preached as something that is really easy to believe. It makes no demands on your life. And it doesn't make it easier for people to accept. I think it makes it easier for people to reject because they're thinking like, if that has no effect on my life and it's no big deal, then I, can, I don't need it. But if we truly are preaching, right, the necessity, the fact that we are sinful, we are not well, we are not righteous, if we impress upon the hearts of people through the conscience of people that they are lawbreakers, then we can give them the solution. And we can impress upon them the demands of what it means to be a Christian as Christ has explained it here. I have a book on my shelf. It's actually called Hard to Believe. It's a book about the gospel. <laughs> Hard to believe. Should we make it easy for people to become Christians and then find out and then have them find out later that this is not what they signed up for? Or should we be honest and upfront saying, this may cost you dearly to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, a week doesn't go by where I have a conversation of someone who's a believer in a family or in a context that is experiencing conflict simply because of their faith in Christ. Conflict at work, conflict with other individuals, conflict because of their stand for Christ. It's not easy being a Christian. Matthew left everything, he went and followed Christ but it would be well worth it. I'm reminded elsewhere where Peter's like, hey, we left everything to follow you. We, we gave up everything to follow you. And, you know, it's like, you could just, I don't like to pretend that I'm in the text, but you can imagine the Lord looking at him and saying, you left what? Are you ready to drink from the cup that I'm going to drink from? Are you ready to undergo a baptism that I'm going to undergo? You've left nothing that you will not receive a hundred or a thousand times fold in eternity. What, are we, what do we think that we are giving up when we die to ourselves and, and surrender ourselves and, and confess our sins? What do we think that we are and that we have that we're so amazing that we just don't want to give it up because we don't think Christ is worth it? I think you get to a point where you realize like, in light of eternity, I really have nothing here to hang on to. My hair's falling out. My body's going south. I mean, the outer man's being decayed day by day. But the inner man's being renewed. And so here's the point. We are not giving up that much, friends. We can give up our lives in order to gain it. Right? He is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim Elliot. Christ said what? If you want to keep your life, you're going to lose it. If you will lose your life, you will find it. You will keep it. You will gain it. Just give it up. Give up your sin. Give up your ways and follow Christ. And what does that practically mean? Well, for Matthew, it means at least this much. He would have Jesus and his friends over for dinner. Now, I'm not going to launch off into a diatribe on hospitality, but here practically, this is exactly what we have taking place. Time and time again through Scripture, whether it's the Philippian jailer or others, when they get saved, Lydia, you name it, guess what? Come to my house. One time Jesus told uh, Zacchaeus he was going to his house. You know, we got to go eat. we got to go celebrate. So we have the conversion of the tax collector. Then we have a collection of sinners in verse 15. And as he reclined at the table in his house, this was customary, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Luke tells us in, in chapter 5 that out of gratitude to Jesus, he had him for a great feast. So we see where Matthew's heart is. He followed Jesus for salvation, and Jesus followed him home for a reception. And man, he must have had a good tax business. He must have had a large house. He had many people there. Many sinners and tax collectors along with Jesus and many disciples. 
But here they are reclining at the table. I don't want to belabor this too much, but it's really a sign of acceptance, a sign of identification. You have someone across the table. It's really a sign of fellowship and warmth and in every culture and all places, you know, that, that's just a sign of hospitality and fellowship. We're breaking bread together. And here you have Jesus really identifying. I mean, he wasn't sitting on the edge of his chair, kind of like, what am I doing here? I mean, he's reclining. He's reclining. He's at home. He's accepting of sinners. And here he is. And this was a challenge for the religious and cultural traditions of the day by intentionally associating with despised tax collectors and sinners. And by the way, this banquet was for an honored guest. Again, it doesn't say in the text, but perhaps Matthew wanted to bring all his friends over. <laughs> you guys got to get saved too. Come on over. What we find is Jesus really bucking the religious establishment. Now, whether the religious leaders were there, I don't know, but they knew about it. They were always somewhere in the background. Sometimes they're in the foreground. We do know they were highly irritated with him for associating with low lives. You see, Pharisees, the separated ones, would never defile themselves by eating with sinners or tax collectors. They would never defile themselves. They had developed a system of 16, 613 rules, do's and don'ts. Now, wouldn't that be great if we just had a, like a, a, a list on the back wall, 613 do's and don'ts in order for you to be acceptable and to be part of the club? That's really what was going on. 613 rules. And then they had to add rules to the rules. But by them keeping the rules, hypocritically, I must say, they believed they were the separated ones and they were the elite. And they separated themselves from those who didn't keep the rules. They believed the rules kept them pure and righteous. And as we read from 1 John, it is only through Christ in which we're pure and righteous and have our sins cleansed. These sinners and tax collectors, they didn't keep up the rules. Jesus didn't keep up the rules. And that would be a serious problem. Because no rabbi worth his salt would ever associate with these unclean people. So, you have a collection of sinners, and then we have a conflict with the scribes, verse 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw what he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, Why does he eat with t tax collectors and sinners? That's a good question, right? The last time they questioned Jesus, they questioned him in their hearts, but he knew their thoughts. This time they question him, but they don't go to Jesus. That, that would be a mistake. They go to his disciples and they ask this question. And again, Luke's account says they were grumbling. Now, the Pharisees, as I said, expected Jesus and the disciples to observe their laws. But when he didn't, it challenged their authority. And their question was not one of curiosity or concern. It was one of contempt. Why does he eat with those tax collectors and sinners? What's, what is the answer to that question? They saw these individuals as people to stay away from, and Jesus saw them as people to save. These are the people Jesus came to save. Not only would these hypocrites, hypocrites not eat with sinners, they wouldn't be caught eating with Jesus. Do you think about that? Their religion separated them from other people who didn't measure up. And it separated them from the grace of God. Now the Apostle Paul knows something about this. In Philippians 3, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He experienced the grace of God. He determined it was all religious garbage. In Philippians 3, verse 7, he said, Whatever gain I thought I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that came from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul thought he had all this religious attainment and credentials, and it was all garbage because it kept him, just like the Pharisees, it kept him from Jesus Christ. Conversion of the tax collector, verse 14. Collection of sinners, verse 15. Conflict with the scribes, verse 16. The call of the Savior, verse 17. 
And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to call, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now Jesus answers them with a proverb that they couldn't deny. Right? Those who are well have no need of a physician. They couldn't argue with that. And, and Luke tells us, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke adds that word repentance in there. Now the Pharisees would agree that the people in Matthew's house were spiritually sick. They, they wouldn't deny that. But they did not see themselves that way. This is the point Jesus is driving at. The truth is this, that only those who know they're sick and sense their need of a physician will ever go to the physician. I think it makes sense, doesn't it? You usually don't say, I feel pretty healthy today, I think I'll go to the doctor. And you get the metaphor, right? Only those who recognize their sin see their need of a Savior. So, time and time again, you know, trying to convince people to... You know, to, to be saved, right? This is how you get saved. This is how you get to save. They don't even sense their need to be saved. It's useless information. They need to come to the conviction that they need to be saved before we can tell them how to be saved. The Lord's ministry was not directed to the self-righteous, but to those who know themselves as sinners. That is the point of it. He makes the physical analogy to the spiritual analogy. And this truth is illustrated all throughout the Gospels. The pharisaical system offered no grace to those who were in need. So if you were to think about Luke chapter 18, verse 9, I'll read it for us as we come to the conclusion. We have a perfect example of, of what we see here in Mark 2 on display over in Luke 18. And Jesus is referring to the Pharisees and the tax collector. And he's making a huge contrast. He told this parable, Luke 18 verse 9, to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. Now, listen to how many times he mentions himself in this passage. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes at all that I get. But then the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. There we have this story in a nutshell. This is, this is Christ explaining that he is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble and he saves those who know they are sick and can't heal themselves. He shows mercy to those who cry out for mercy. It's a basic gospel message. I thought about this this week as I went to the pediatrician for the last time. Not to embarrass our kids, but they're all adults now. We just recently, went to, for the last time. And all the years I would take the kids to the doctor, there were two doors. I would, one was a wellness and one was sick. In fact, I went to the vet the other day and there were two entrances and I said to Carol, is one a wellness side and a sick side? But I would look at those doors and I'd be like, which one? You know, out of four kids, half of them are sick. I get, I get that. They, they wanted to separate the sick kids from the well kids with, for good reason, right? And we understand this. But this is where I think earthly analogies ultimately break down in, in spiritual realities because when it comes to the church, there are not two doors into the church. There's only one door. We don't have a separate area for the healthy and another area for those who are sick. The church is a hospital for sinners. And as I say, it's not a museum for polishing the saints and putting them on display. I think we need reminding of that sometimes because we want to be faithful to the gospel. We want to be loving one another, but we have to remember something that we are all sinners. We may be saved. We may be saints. 
but we're sinning saved saints. And we got to remember as people come in, they may be in all different places that we're not at. They may be tax collectors or you fill in the blank. 1 Corinthians 6 has a whole list of people that do not inherit the kingdom of God, but yet Paul says such were some of you and such was some of us. We were those things, but we've been washed, we've been regenerated, we've been saved by the grace of God. And it's just a reminder that we do not want to be like the Pharisees and create a good old boy club, right? Whether we like fine theology or whatever it is that we share in common, what we share in common is that we, we need Jesus. We need him. And we have to remember that those who come through the door, they need him too. The church of Jesus Christ is a place where the spiritually sick can come for healing. Yes, we're a collection of sinners that have come to Jesus for forgiveness and healing. I would, I would like to know the end of the story and the outcome of that banquet at Matthew's house. Because I think that, you know what, there were, there were more people coming to Christ that day. And we'll find out someday. But the point I want to make is, praise God for His grace in our lives. Praise God that he saved the most unlikely person ever to be saved. Praise God that even though we're sinners, God's grace abounds even more. And that we have a message for others and we need to reach out to others and to show them the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. All throughout this sermon, it was probably hinted at with the title that I gave it. I was thinking of a sermon I heard years ago at a conference about an evangelist who was uh, had this for a closing song. And it was just such an impactful sermon. And in the providence of God, Barb played it this morning. See, I mean, like, that's a God thing, right? I mean, some of you know this hymn, Softly and Tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. He's calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, death's night is coming, coming for you and for me. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. And of course the refrain is, come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the promise of Jesus that all who will come to him, will, he will no wise uh, cast out. Thank you for the promise of Jesus that all who are weary and heavy laden, all those who are weighed down with sin and the spiritual burdens of trying to achieve perfection, may they come to you, Jesus. And take your yoke upon them and learn from you, for you are gentle and humble of heart. And we pray, Father, that we would come to you constantly. And even now, we pray, even this morning, that there are those who have heard your call. Call to salvation, call to self-denial, call to a life of service and sacrifice, but a life of unending joy. And may they answer the call of our King. We pray, Father, that sinners would truly come home, even this morning, and that all of heaven would rejoice. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.